Doctor, thank you for making the time to talk to us. Thank you for having me. So you walked out of this meeting with President Biden yesterday. That's right. What made you come here to Washington and go to the White House and accept the invitation? I mean, I think there's a lot of us right now that have a serious sense of urgency and panic about what's taking place in Gaza, and specifically about the looming Rafah invasion that could take place where there are 1.7 million Palestinians. Everybody's concerned. Everybody in the international NGO community, every Palestinian American, Arab American, Muslim American, people who are invested in this, we're very nervous about what's taking place. And so it seems to me that there's one person who can maybe make a difference and put a stop to this, and that's President Biden. Well, President Biden says he is trying to uh, redirect Israel from a full-on assault in Rafah, southern Gaza, where there is this concentration of civilians gathered. But from what you discussed yesterday, do you think the president's doing enough? I mean, I certainly don't think so. And it's not just me who believes that. I was in New York last week prior to the UN Security Council resolution. I talked to many member states, many members of the Security Council, and they all felt that if the White House decided to make Rafah a red line, that the war would stop tomorrow, that it just required President Biden to say, under no circumstance can this take place. Tell me what happened inside the room when President Biden and Vice President Harris sat down at the table. Who was there? What did you share with them? Yeah. I mean, it was myself, uh, the only Palestinian American in the room. There were other medical professionals who were going to bear witness firsthand, eyewitness testimony to the humanitarian catastrophe. They had been in Gaza themselves. They had been in Gaza themselves, and their testimony obviously was going to be very important because what we heard was that this would be the first time that the president was going to hear from people who had been in Gaza on the ground after October 7th. And also there were various members from the Muslim American community and members of the administration. And President Biden walks in, says very few words, says something to the effect of, we know you guys have been working hard. This is going to be a listening session. We know a little bit about what's taking place. And then he pointed at me and asked me to start. And that's when I just kind of communicated that message about Rafah, about the concerns that I had having been in Khan Yunus and watching the hospital that I was in fall under siege and become defunct, and all of the massive amount of people that migrated to Rafah and were sheltering there now, and that there's no way, there's no alternative, there is no safe way to do this. It would be an absolute massacre if there's an invasion into Rafah. And then I asked to be excused out of respect for my community who's mourning, who's grieving, who um, has really wanted to be heard and has felt silence and, ex and excluded this entire time. And I handed him a letter from an eight-year-old. Her name is Hadil. She's an orphan and she's in Rafah right now. And basically she said she was begging the president not to invade. And you shared that letter with us as well. Um, tell me, as a Palestinian American who has also gone in and worked in the hospitals in Gaza, what did you see? And I understand you're going back. Yeah. Why is it worth the risk when so many aid workers have been killed going in just trying to help? Why are you volunteering to go in? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. We were at Nasser Hospital. It was the second largest hospital in the Gaza Strip, the last remaining hospital that could do multiple surgeries at the same time. And we were overwhelmed, treating people on the floor, I mean, there were families sheltering in and around the hospital, 10,000 of them, literally in the hallways of the hospitals. That's where they were sheltering. And we had no space. We had no medicine. And then we watched that hospital get raided. 70 of the healthcare workers abducted. Already 400 healthcare workers have been killed. By who? By the Israeli military. And it's important to note that the Israeli military has done this to multiple hospitals. I mean, this is not just a one-time incident. So what I saw were families in these hospitals. I saw children playing Ring Around the rosy. I saw kids who were affected by this war, who had been injured by it, who had been traumatized by it. And it's been al Nasser, Shifa, al Rantisi, Kamal Adwan. I can list hospital after hospital. And so that's really what makes me want to go back, is realizing that these people in the Gaza Strip are under a tremendous amount of pressure and pain, including the healthcare workers, including the aid workers. And if it's not people like us who are going to stand with them because the entire world has turned their back on them, then who else is going to do it? When you were in working in the hospital, did you and your fellow doctors witness any terror infrastructure, any work from Hamas or other terror groups operating in the area? We saw the opposite of that. We saw tiny mattresses where families of four and five would be staying in, in, in hospital corridors and in hallways. We saw rooms that were flooded with kids, with elderly people. I mean, a room that should be having one or two patients had six. 
we saw pharmacies that were essentially out of all of stock, no antibiotics, no anesthetics. Uh, we saw blood that was everywhere on the floor because we didn't have enough water to clean it. So I didn't see any of that. Did you share those details with the president and vice president? You know, I've been sharing those details since I've come back. Um, I've been sharing those details with anybody that will listen, senators, congressmen. Um, I said that to the president and the vice president prior to leaving, that there are real people that are there, innocent people, families, and they've been displaced multiple times. They've lost so much, including their homes. They've lost their everything, their livelihood, and that the idea of an invasion into Rafah by the Israeli military is just something that could be so disastrous to a place that's already seen so much disaster and humanitarian suffering. Now, you are a doctor in Chicago in an ER, the south side that's right. of the city. Yeah. You know what it can be to work in a tough neighborhood. Right. How does that compare? Did, were you in any way prepared? for what it was like? There's no comparison. I mean, it was overwhelming. What were the injuries? Yeah, it, it, overwhelming from day one. I mean, with respect to, we see gunshot wounds, right, in, in the south side of Chicago. We see stab wounds, penetrating trauma. We see fires and car accidents. What's happening in Gaza is that you're seeing this on a massive scale. There is a real intense war taking place in a very urban environment. And so you see some of these injuries, but on a massive level we, that no system, not even the United States, would be able to handle. And to be frank with you, I felt very overwhelmed. And if it wasn't for my Palestinian healthcare workers that were holding my hand for the first several days that I was there, I would have been useless and been an additional burden on them. And so, I mean, I have, to, I have to tip my hat to them because they are absolutely heroes in every sense of the word. These are people who are not being paid. These are people who have also been displaced, people who have lost family members, and they show up to work every single day. And they're doing so much with so little. And I mean, they deserve so much credit not to be detained like 200 of them are or 400 of them that have been killed. They deserve to be praised as heroes, and you know that's that's really unfortunate. You went in with the World Health Organization, is that right? That's right. I'm with uh, Med Global, a nonprofit organization that, under the World Health Organization, we joined one of their emergency medical teams into Gaza. What were the majority of victims that you saw? Were they? Adult males? Were they women? Were they children? What did you witness? I mean, the vast majority were women and children. You know, we saw some fathers and brothers and uh, young young men, but the vast majority were women and children. And I remember specifically an elderly woman, 66 years old, was on the back of a donkey cart because there's no fuel in Gaza, so there's not a lot of cars driving around. And she was hit by a drone. And I remember her coming into the emergency department and just wondering, what did she do to deserve that? Lung collapsed and paralyzed from the waist down because the bullet was lodged into her spine. So tell me again, though, if the importance is bearing witness, why walk out of that meeting with the president? Why not make your case and sit in front of him if, as you say, he has not heard from eyewitnesses before? I mean, that's an excellent question. And it's something that I debated within myself of what should I do? What's the proper moment here? Uh, there were other physicians who were going to bear witness to the testimony. They were going to make sure that that message got out. You coordinated. Absolutely. And I wanted to make sure that we all knew, you know, what could take place. I wasn't sure that I was going to walk out of this meeting unless it felt like it was the right thing to do. And when the president really didn't even mention Gaza or Palestine in his first initial comments to me, uh, I felt that I needed to get out and I needed to at least express the hurt and the pain that the entire Palestinian American community is feeling. Now, I don't speak on their behalf. I'm just one Palestinian American. But the fact that there were no other in Palestinian Americans in the room and that so many people are suffering right now, it was important for me to at least communicate that hurt and to walk away from the president like we felt he's walked away from us. Why do you think there were no other Palestinian Americans in the room? I mean, there, there aren't large numbers of Palestinian American doctors to turn to that are um, sort of organized and lobbying right now. No, no, you're right. And but you know, there are plenty of Palestinians who are educators, who are experts on what's going on, lawyers, there are organizers, activists, many people who can contribute to the discussion and can contribute in a very meaningful way. And what we've heard from them is that over the last six months they haven't been given that opportunity. Maybe a few of them have, but the vast majority feel like they've been excluded. But you have in the past been a supporter of President Biden and Vice President Harris, is that right? I have been a supporter. I was very, very excited when President Biden was elected. I thought that this was going to mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people, but mostly good things. And I thought that it was going to bring a change in, with respect to policy in the Middle East for more peace there. I'm not a political person, but I was hoping for peace. I'm a physician. I care about people suffering. 
And unfortunately, these last six months have disappointed not just myself, but many people. Do you know then, will you go and will you vote? And will you be able on an issue of conscience for yourself? Will that affect how you how you end up at the ballot box and which lever you pull? Yeah, I mean, Margaret, to be honest with you, it's affecting how I feel about the next couple of days. I mean, I'm very, it's changed everything with respect to our lives. Palestinian Americans will tell you our lives are upside down. We don't even know what we're going to do for the celebration for the end of month of Ramadan. We don't know how, what next week is going to look like. We're all worried about what's happening in Gaza. And because so, you know people? Yeah, we know people, absolutely. And, you know, there has been intense following of this, of what's going on. We know the intimate details of people who are suffering in Gaza. We know their names. We know the family members that have been lost. We know about the kids that haven't been in school for six months. And so for us, it affects everything in our lives, and it's going to affect how we vote. It's going to affect how we feel about the political engagement that in this country. It's going to affect how we feel about policy in the Middle East. And I can tell you that it's not just people who are angry and frustrated. It's people who are mourning and grieving. Do you believe that you were able to attend that meeting because of the political risk or because there is an openness to policy change? No, I think, uh, yeah, I think I was able to attend that meeting because there is some posturing or there is a change in rhetoric. And I can acknowledge that. There is a change in rhetoric with respect to what's happening in Gaza. By the and Biden administration. By the Biden administration, acknowledging the humanitarian suffering. But at six months, it needs to be a lot more than rhetoric. And I think what people are looking for are concrete steps towards peace, towards a ceasefire, towards avoiding an invasion of Rafah, and towards getting people food and water. Um, and so that's not what we're seeing. And I think that's what we're demanding. Dr. Ahmed, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.